Geometric Probability and Experimental Probability 13.2b. To understand probability, you need to have seen 13.2a, the one previous video before this one, and it's linked in the description along with the high school geometry playlist if you need it. Geometric probability is a form of theoretical probability determined by a ratio of lengths, areas, or volumes. It involves geometric measure. We can use geometric probability to determine the probability that a dart will land in a certain area of a dartboard, a point is in the shaded region of a figure, or to determine the odds of winning a game of chance by the size of the area. In this lesson, you're going to see some subscripts next to the A. This capital A is for area, and this little t subscript means the total, so it's the total area. When you see a little u, it's going to be the area of the unshaded. If you see a little s, it's going to be the area of the shaded. We can find geometric probability by finding the ratio of areas. We have three semicircles with diameters of 2, 4, and 6. That would be the entire length here. Now arrange to form a figure. If a point inside the figure is chosen at random, what is the probability that the point is inside this purple region? We find the ratio of the area of the purple region to the area of the entire semicircle. So we're going to find the area of this purple section to the area of this entire semicircle. The area of a semicircle formula is half pi r squared, because a full circle is pi r squared, isn't it? So we're going to do half of that. The area total, here's our a with our subscript t, is equal to half pi 3 squared. If this is 6 inches, that's the diameter, and half of it, the radius, would be 3 inches. That's half pi 9, which equals 4.5 pi. So that's the area of the total semicircle. The area of the unshaded portion would be half pi 2 squared, because that would be the radius of this one, too. And the radius of this one would be a 1. So we have this plus half pi 1 squared. That's going to give us half pi 4 plus half pi 1. This is going to just be 2 pi plus 0.5 pi. That's going to give us 2.5 pi for the area of the unshaded portion. Now we subtract to find the purple area. The area total minus the area of the unshaded portion is going to equal the area of the purple region. So we have 4.5 pi minus this 2.5 pi. That means the area for the purple region is 2 pi. The area of the purple region divided by the area total is going to give us 2 pi divided by 4.5 pi. This pi and this pi cancel each other out as a 1. So we have 2 over 4.5, which we can say is 4 ninths. We can multiply the numerator and denominator by 2 to get rid of this decimal, can't we? So we have 4 ninths. That's the probability that the point is in the purple region. And let's take a look at this diagram. We have this green triangle. And if this side is 15 centimeters and this side is 15 centimeters, and it's showing all the angles are congruent, it must be an equilateral triangle. It's showing this side of the little blue triangle is 4 centimeters, and so is this one. And we can find the probability that a point chosen at random inside the large triangle is inside the small triangle. We find the ratio of the small triangle to the ratio of the large triangle. The small and large triangles are similar triangles. We did that in video 7.5b. We did pr proportional perimeters and areas, and the theorem told us that the ratio of the perimeters 
Here we've got a 4, a 4, so that must be a 4. So the perimeter is a 12. And this is 15, 15, and that must be 15. So we have 12 45ths for the ratio of the perimeters. That's going to give us 4 15ths when we reduce the fraction. The ratio of areas would be 4 squared over 15 squared. This squared over this squared. That means we have 16 225ths. This EF is parallel to BC, isn't it? Now let's take a look at this diagram first. We have a, an orange hexagon inside of a square. So a dartboard is a hexagon inscribed in a square. It's a very odd shaped dartboard, isn't it? Two of the vertices of the hexagon bisect two of the sides of the square. And the remaining four vertices, so that would be right here, right here, right here and right here. They trisect the other two sides of the square. So we have one, two, three, four vertices that are trisecting. That's splitting it in three. We're bisecting is splitting it into two, isn't it? So they trisect the other two sides of the square. So what's the probability that a dart will hit the shaded area, the orange area of the dartboard? So the first thing we're going to do is let x equal the side length of the square. So the area of the square is going to be x times x, or x squared. That means if this is bisected, that this is half x and this is half x, and so is this and this. And if this is trisected, then this is one third x, one third x, one third x. So the area of each of the four right triangles is half base height. It's going to be half times the base times the height, isn't it? That's the formula. That means for this side, for these, we have half times half x times one third x, which is equal to one twelfth x squared. For the area of the unshaded portion, we would have four, one, two, three, four times one twelfth x squared. That's going to give us one third x squared. So now we've got the area of the unshaded portion. The area of the shaded portion is going to be x squared, the entire square, minus this one third x squared. That's going to give us two thirds x squared. And the probability a dart lands in the shaded region is two thirds x squared over x squared. We can cancel these out as a one, can't we? which means we have two-thirds, or 0.66 written as a decimal, or 66%. We can estimate the probability of an event by using data or by experiment. If a doctor says that an operation has an 80% probability of success, 80% is an estimate of probability. It's based on similar case histories, and people who have gone through this illness and needed an operation and their outcomes. Each repetition of an experiment is a trial. And the sample space of an experiment is the set of all possible outcomes. The experimental probability of an event is the ratio of the number of times the event occurs, that's the frequency, to the number of trials. And we'll explain this more. So for your notes, for experimental probability, it's equal to the number of times the event occurs divided by the number of trials that are done. An experimental probability is often used to estimate theoretical probability and to make predictions. The theoretical probability of an event is the ratio of favorable outcomes to the total number of outcomes. The experimental probability of an event is the ratio of the number of times the event occurs to the total number of trials that were done. A bar graph shows the results of 100 tosses, that would be 100 trials, 
of a number cube, a die. We need to find each experimental probability. Taking a closer look at the diagram, this is the results of 100 rolls of a number cube. That's 100 trials. Here's the frequency that the rolls occurred. And you can see we've got a scale here going 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's the number rolled on the number cube, on the die. And this is the frequency of how often that number was rolled out of the 100. So a 1 appeared 17 times. They rolled a 2 21 times, a 3 16 times, a 4 11 times, a 5 22 times, and a 6 13 times. If we add the 17, 21, 16, 11, 22, and 13, it should total 100. So what's the experimental probability of rolling a 3? Well, the outcome 3 occurred 16 times out of the 100 trials. The probability of 3 is equal to 16 one hundredths. We can reduce that as 4 25ths, which as a decimal would be 0.16 or 16 one hundredths. What would be the probability of rolling a perfect square? Remember, a perfect square is like 1 squared, 2 squared, where we would get a 1 or a 4. 3 squared would be a 9. 4 squared would be a 16. Those are perfect squares. So the probability of perfect square, the only way we could have a perfect square here is by rolling the 1 or the 4. The 1 happened 17 times. The 4 happened 11 times. We add the 17 plus 11 because they're both perfect squares, so we use both pieces of data. Over 100, that's 28 one hundredths. That simplifies to 7 25ths, or 0.28 is a decimal. Using the same information, the same data, what is our experimental probability of rolling a number other than 5? Well, if it's other than 5, we need to use the complement. So we find the probability of rolling a 5. That was a 22 right here. So that's 22 one hundredths. We take that 22 one hundredths and subtract it from 1, the total, as 100. See? So we have 1 minus the probability of 5 is going to equal 1 minus that 22 one hundredths. That's going to be 78 one hundredths, or we could reduce that to 39 fiftieths but it's written as 0.78 as a decimal. We can write P and then this symbol for not 5. We can write P not 5 is 39 50ths or 0.78. Now some textbooks use this symbol for not, but that can be confused with the symbol for similar, which is doing different types of math, but a lot of mathematicians use this symbol for not just to be more straightforward. It's up to you. This symbol is just for logical negation. That means logically not. Take a look at this chart here. It says card suits, hearts, diamonds, clubs, spades, and the number. We have five, nine, seven, and five. So this table shows the results of picking one card from a deck of 52, recording the suit, that's the hearts, diamonds, clubs, spades, then replacing the card for the next pick. So it's really important that we put the card back into the deck for the next pick. So what's the experimental probability of picking a heart or not picking a heart? Well, for picking a heart, we've got 5 plus 9 plus 7 plus 5 picks. That means we had 26 trials where we picked a card and put it back. And we picked heart five times, so that's five out of 26. It's 526, which is approximately 0.19. The probability of not picking a heart would be one minus that 526. So it'd be 2126. That's approximately 0.81. What's the experimental probability of picking a black card? Well, there were 26 picks and 12 were black. 
So we've got the 7 plus 5 over the 26, that's 1226, which can be simplified to 6 thirteenths or approximately 0.46. Now, for those of you who need it and need to go a little deeper, Chapter 15 of my Algebra 2 playlist is all about counting and probability. So our next video is going to be probability of independent events. We have Lesson 13.3, which is split into A, B, C, and D, so they're not very, very long, like an hour long. And the next one after that is going to be dependent events and conditional probability, we're going to use a table to find conditional probability. Then we're going to determine whether events are independent or dependent to wrap up 13.3. So remember the difference between theoretical probability, which we talked about in the previous video, and experimental probability. Theoretical probability of an event is the ratio of favorable outcomes, what we want to happen, to the total number of outcomes. Experimental probability of an event is the ratio of the number of times the event occurred to the total number of trials. Like how many times did we get a heart when we picked 26 cards? So if you need more information on this topic, check out the description. Look for the link to Algebra 2 Chapter 15, which talks all about counting and probability. In that Algebra 2 chapter, we talk about the binomial theorem and binomial expansion. We talk about Pascal's triangle and subsets, compound probabilities and multiplying probabilities. So if you think that would help you, again, look for the link in the description or at the end of the video. I hope you're doing well, and I'll see you for the next lesson. Bye.